I am DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I want to do my introduction to the channel. A lot of people have been asking me to do one on some of my background and what I've done. So here's my video resume. <laughs> uh, I hope you enjoy it right after this. So I wanted to do uh, a kind of an introduction to the channel. I've been meaning to do this for some time, and I wanted to explain why I'm making these videos. Although you'll probably have to wait for the answer at the end. You know me. I always have to go back into history and explain things. So I started out as a student at the University of Illinois in 1974, and my roommates that uh, were in the same dorm as I, one of them was a computer science uh, a student, the other one was a computer engineering student. So we got interested uh, in the, in this building that we kept passing every time we would go steal time, yes, we, we would go steal time on the IBM mainframe in order to print out uh, photographs, you know, the, uh, the digitized images that we used to hang on our walls and try to impress people with them. But... Uh, but in passing uh, this strange building that looked like a power plant, uh, there was this really weird orange glow. And so we went up and we tried the door and the door was open. So we went in and this is what we discovered were these terminals scattered around a, uh, a room and people were, some of them were playing games, some of them were doing study and some of them were writing code. And so uh, I, we all, I, all three of us got interested in what was going on with it. I was a forestry student at the time, so I was in the Department of Agriculture. The other two guys were, of course, engineers. I knew nothing of computers. And so this was really my first uh, kind of a foray into it. And what a beginning this turned out to be. Uh, Plato was uh, the program logic for automatic teaching operations. It was basically the, one of the first systems that supported computer-aided instruction. It was uh, started by Dr. Donald Bitzer uh, about 1963, I think, somewhere around there. He went, there was some concern about the number of kids that were dropping out of high school, especially in the inner cities, and they wanted to have some way to help these, help these kids get their GED, get them back into school, make things interesting for them, and hopefully uh, be able to provide some support for the teachers. Uh, and, and getting classroom material available to them. So this was supported largely by the National Science Foundation uh, and, a, and uh, several grants from them supported this throughout the years. This was uh, the, uh, the, one of the first systems that used a graphical user interface that I'm aware of. I know there's probably some others that played some games that were earlier that used uh, graphics terminals. I mean, all terminals are really graphics. It just depends on whether or not they have character generation chips in them or not. But this ran on a Control Data Corporation 6400. Uh, that was the baby brother to the CDC 6600, which was one of the first supercomputers ever designed and built. Uh, and of course, the designer of that was Seymour Cray. Uh, and then we also had a secondary computer that was used. It was a Cyber 73. So those two machines together formulated the uh, core of the University of Illinois' uh, uh, efforts to build this system. And that effort was conducted at the Computer Education Research or Computer Based Education Research Lab, or CERL, that was in an old power plant that was next to DSL, which was the Digital Science Lab, where the excuse me, the IBM computers were, and we used to always have running jokes between the CDC guys and the IBM guys because the CDC would basically blow it out of the water. It was so fast for its time. Um, so, and this is really the system. A lot of people don't know this because they always credit Xerox PARC with the invention of the first graphical-based user interface on a terminal, but it wasn't. This was. Uh, and in fact, Xerox Park used to come regularly over to the University of Illinois to learn about what we were doing. And I have to say, Alan Kay, I met him a couple of times, who was the leader of the lab at Xerox Park. He used to laugh at us because he thought it was really a stupid idea to put a thousand terminals on a supercomputer. He thought that was a total waste of time. <laughs> but uh, he, of course, went on. Uh, his project uh, that he had while he was in college was the Dynabook. And the Dynabook looked a lot like a modern iPad. Um, and um, 
and he went on to develop the uh, Xerox uh, Star, and the Xerox Star uh, was really the first graphical user interface, which sparked Microsoft Windows and also the Mac OS. This is that's where it all began. So yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, <laughs> I did uh, I, I I took up. Uh, Hacking, <laughs> so I kind of got in trouble. My first foray in there, I stole a password uh, from one of the uh, uh, Plato authors that was working in the education side of the university, the, the you know, for teachers. The, the, it was a, you know that string of stuff. So I had to go to Dr. Bitzer and apologize, you know, for stealing this password. And then he made me go apologize to who would later become a, a very good friend. Her ha her handle was Sligger, and uh, I always always have to thank her for all the help she gave me in learning to program. Because I told Bitzer, I said, you know, hey, I, I just wanted to learn these machines, and so he set up uh, an, a, a a phone call between him and uh, uh, Bill Golden, who was the administrator for Searle. And uh, and got me my first account, and uh, and I started actively learning how to program this machine, and it was fun. It was really a lot of fun. And after graduation, um, you know, some of my work kind of preceded me a little bit. And Caterpillar Tractor wanted me to come and and write a geometry program for them. They had a a GED course. Uh, for students that had dropped out of, of uh, high school and wanted to go back and get pick up their diploma. And so I wrote this geometry course uh, for them and with them. And I, I kind of say that that year was just so much fun uh, in uh, taking math and learning how to do things with uh, Tutor, which was the programming language that you used with this. Uh, it, was, it was a fun time. That's all I can say. Uh, and my first real job was in 1978 and 1980, and this was on a Honeywell H2020. 32K of memory, it ran COBOL, uh, typical, you know, punch card, uh, magnetic tape, and we had a couple of disk drives that we used, and, of course, the printer. So, yeah, it was pretty much card to print, uh, card to tape, tape to print. Uh, and then uh, uh, that machine really couldn't go much further. It, and the, the school district really wanted to um, take this up to the next level. But I had to learn COBOL for this machine. I didn't know COBOL. And so I, I used Plato. <laughs> I still had my sign on for Plato and had access uh, that was granted to me by the University of Illinois Medical School, which was in, in my hometown. And uh, so I would go there at night, had clearance for them to go in and use the machines, and I used them to learn COBOL. So uh, that was my first foray into a real computer language at the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, that machine just wouldn't cut it, and, uh, the, and the school district decided to get a new machine, and they went to Burroughs for that. And we, the, uh, in the process of migrating the uh, software over to Burroughs was one thing, but then the, the school district wanted to get things online, get the uh, get uh, terminals in all of the high schools and eventually maybe into the grade schools as well, so that instead of having to print reports all the time, they could just go and look up stuff, do queries on the database. And so I, uh, I worked pretty diligently on that. We had a B1855. It was uh, a, what Burroughs in the large accounts or the LA division of, of Burroughs calls a small system. It is basically a, a baby of the larger 6,500, 6,700, 6,800 size machines, uh, or which would be their large systems. But uh, Burroughs was impressed with what I had accomplished in less than a year. I think the, the school district's plans was to complete this work in five years, and I did the student record size in, in less than a year. I mean, I, I had come here, <laughs> had come from an online system to card to print, and it was like, wow, this is kind of backwards. And so I was kind of excited and wanted to move it into the online. So I learned as, as quickly as I could and moved over the student records within the first year. Uh, and Burroughs was so impressed, they offered me a job. And so I went to work for them in 1980 in the large accounts division as a systems rep, which was uh, a software technical guy that went out and helped customers either install the operating system or performance tune or worked on software problems that they were having and fix bugs and in the operating system and so forth. So it was there I learned SDL. And SDL is the system data language that Burroughs uses on that size of a machine. It is an offshoot of Algol 68. 
And uh, that was a very fun time. Uh, alcohol is a wonderful language. I still like it, as you can see. I still like alcohol. And, uh, and uh, it is probably uh, one of the fastest compilers I have ever been around. And I still haven't seen anything today that comes close to how fast alcohol can compile. Uh, so anyway, the software on those machines that I worked with, I worked on... Uh, the B1000 series, which would have been the small system. I worked on a medium system, which we had two customers that both had, uh, well, actually three. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a bank service bureau that processed on, uh, I think it was a B4800, which was a pretty large machine. Um, and, uh, and then I had two, a B2700 and a B2800 that were local in town. And then I had one large account, which, of course, was the University of Illinois. They had a, a 6800 or 6700, I guess, uh, that was located in the civil engineering division of the, uh, of, of the school. So yeah, I learned so much there. I, I just, I can't, I, I mean, we went through a number of transitions with Burroughs. We went uh, into the uh, cluster of machines. We, the Burroughs had, had purchased... Uh, 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 con uh, gosh, parts of uh, different uh, uh, like computer consoles and some of them in order to bring Unix into their their work set, and so we that was my first foray in learning Unix, and I really wanted to learn more. The uh, office where I lived uh, in my local hometown was closing down, and they wanted me to move to Chicago, and I, <laughs> I didn't want to move to Chicago. <laughs> and so I took a job with AT&T Data Systems Division. Since I wanted to learn more about Unix, I guess the place to go would be to go to Unix uh, on the, uh, at AT&T, since they were the developer of it and the owner of it. Um, I worked as a system engineer there on the 3B2. I think we had the smallest one I ever touched was the 310, and the largest was the 3B4000, which was uh, one of the first uh, multiprocessor machines that basically was uh, had a central core, a B, I think it was a B, uh, 3B15 as the central core, and then it had 3B600, 3B2600s that you could plug into the backplane, and you had a number of those. And so it was the first parallel machine that I ever worked around. Uh, a fantastic box, and uh, I, I, at and sent me off to Murray Hill to learn Unix, learn the internals, and uh, the teacher of the class was uh, Dennis Ritchie himself. So I, I was surprised that day when he walked into the classroom, and so I was out there for, I guess, about four weeks, and uh, during that time learned uh, the internals of Unix and learned uh, all, how, to, how to work with the utilities and also got started into C. Uh, and that's where I learned C and how to write bash scripts and how to develop demo programs for these new terminals that they called the Blit terminals. Uh, I think the official commercial name was the uh, 63 or 630. The term, yeah, the, the 630 was the official name of the, the Blit commercial version. And uh, that, well, of course, had a mouse and a graphical user interface and it hooked into a serial line that was connected to the machine. So it was during those years that AT&T and Sun merged uh, their versions of Unix together. That would have been uh, the Sun OS from Sun, which was based on Berkeley's, uh, uh, Berkeley's version of Unix, and then AT&T System 5, uh, which would have been the AT&T side. They merged those together, and they created uh, the System 5 Release 4, uh, which had Open, uh, open Look, I think was the name of the uh, uh, X11 uh, graphical desktop, and it's very primitive by today's standards. But uh, that particular step that AT&T took split the entire Unix community uh, because companies like uh, HP and IBM and DEC all threw up their arms and went, oh, my God, they're going to own the entire industry, and we can't let this happen. And so Unix pretty much <laughs> cratered after about 1992. But uh, it was here that we started integrating PCs and Macs into the environment with Unix machines as the host. And that was kind of fun. Uh, and of course, it used a new protocol called TCP IP, which I had learned while I was working for them. And that led into this, uh, after talking to uh, one of the customers I had was the local university and uh, one of the professors there, had, he always liked to feed me new things, you know, because uh, yeah, that's their job. That's what they like to do is be one up on, on, on the so-called expert. But uh, we became good friends and, uh, and we went down together to Urbana to look at something called Netscape. And we didn't know what it was and it was just uh, something new. And, and it was before it was released, before anybody had a hold of the code, we got a look at it and uh, got it on floppy disk. And we took it back and played around with it a little bit. 
And I got interested in it. And it was using this uh, new thing, uh, TCP IP, and it was using a protocol over the net. And the hospitals kind of went, hey, you know about this. Why don't you come and teach us? And so I went to, uh, I, I started out as a consultant doing some work in this area because I was interested in it. So I left AT&T in order to do that. <clears throat> and, uh, and eventually joined the, uh, uh, joined the staff at one of the hospitals there. I was the director for, uh, for one of the clinics and then became a, 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 what they call a consultant for the hospital, a chain of hospitals that was there. But yeah, we, we would have nightly battles with the Novell people because they, well, this is the network of the future, and Novell was not the network of the future, TCPIP was, and we all knew that. We finally, and, and the, it was pretty heated. The, yeah, the discussions were pretty heated sometimes, and eventually we got rid of the Novell side and they got them, got them over to TCPIP. But that was some fun times working there. Uh, I went to IBM in 1997 uh, and basically joined the global services team. They looked at my experience. They knew that I had worked a lot in the web. Uh, I think I did my first website in 1992, if I remember right, somewhere around in there. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so I, they, they wanted me to work as a system architect in global services. And the first, exa the first project I had was given was to help write the strategy for e-business. And that became the e-commerce systems that IBM uh, uh, marketed and later the portal and some other things that came out of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I worked a lot with the software group up in, in Toronto. I worked with uh, another one that was uh, out at Alameda. And, and I got interested in, in working with them because, hey, these guys are on the ground. They're doing the stuff that's new. And so I got excited and I wanted to join that team. And so I did. Uh, and that is where I learned uh, the cloud because that's what they were working on at the time. That would have been about five years before cloud became a, a, a word in the technology language because that's typically how things work. It takes, you know, three to five years to develop something in order to bring it to market. To see, you have to do a lot of tests and make sure that it's going to be something you could sell, right? This is where I started to move away from the technical side. I, I mean, I love the technical side of the business, but the, it was just pushed into the leadership role. And I, I have to say that the leadership side is not my thing. It's not what I like. Um, so I went to work for Raytheon uh, Intelligence Services Division in 2006. And this was kind of different for me. Uh, this was a, a totally brand new application uh, for me, anyway, of using, and this was all based on Sun, using AT&T Unix. Uh, and um, it was kind of interesting to work on this. It was Air Force's DCGS, which is their common ground system for collecting imagery off of high-altitude aircraft like the U-2 and Global Hawk. Now, our system was not used for spying. This is not part of the CIA. This is, uh, this is part of ground tactical operations during battles. This is sort of like the guys they would take up in a balloon and would spot the battlefield and then determine uh, you know, what targets to uh, go after. So that's, that's more of what that was about. So it was an unclassified program. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's here I learned uh, this was a fairly large system. I mean, we had millions of lines of code. We had uh, a few hundred computers that were in the rack, and there was many different uh, enclaves in that rack. Uh, there was different enclaves of racks that we had to manage, and, of course, they were dispersed in, in a cluster across many geographic locations. Uh, and so, yeah, I learned the mechanics of integration. I mean, really true uh, large project integration, support for millions of lines of code, formal testing methodologies that were dictated both by Raytheon and by the government. Uh, the security procedures that are used to bring a system up to a secured level, what they consider secured. Uh, and that includes all aspects from the facility to the power to the networking to uh, the machines themselves, the operating system, the software, the data, everything, all of it. So yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of an interesting foray into all of that, and um, and also to build up the storage arrays needed to handle volumes of the the imagery that was coming off of those two platforms. So yeah, I ended my career there as the chief architect for that program, and uh, I enjoyed working with that with the many facades of that. Uh, uh, of the different uh, contractors that were involved in the industry around us and also in the different areas within the Air Force. So I learned an awful lot in a very short period of time. It was like uh, I used to uh, 
people talk about drinking from a fire hose. No, that was drinking from a a, 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 a waterfall. <laughs> That's what that was like, and uh, catching up to speed. So now, <laughs> why why am I bothering doing this channel? What what is what is what am I getting out of this? I'm, I don't want nothing out of this. What I, I'm trying to do is I've learned so much from pe different people over the years, and it's kind of been not fair. I mean, it's all been one way coming in uh, to me. And, I, and so it's my turn. It's my turn to give back to you, uh, the community of what some of I know, what, of what I know. Now, the technology that I know is obsolete, but that's not the important thing. I'm still learning. I'll probably continue to learn until I drop dead. But, uh, you know, it, the technology always changes. But the one common thing that never do, does is you need drive. A person, that I, I, like I said in uh, several videos past, I've known a lot of people that say, I threw up their hands, I know everything, I'm done, this is boring, I, there's nothing I'm ever going to learn again. And those people usually close down, they lock themselves out of few good positions within their companies, and they don't progress as a, a valued member. I mean, it is all about value. And um, it's value to yourself, and it's satisfaction to yourself first, and then it's value to your company that you're working for. After all, they are the ones paying you. But it's a drive. It's a, it's the fire in your heart and your soul to learn something new because this is this you're standing on a on a conveyor belt, and if you're if all you're going to do is learn to program in Java or in uh, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, maybe it's some of the modern languages or, or not. If you stand there very long, you're going to become obsolete. So you got to move with it, and you got to learn and push to learn new things. And so that's what this channel is about, is to help you start down the path. I cannot do in 30 minutes a video to explain technologies like LDAP. My God, there are books written on that stuff. Um, so, I mean, but what I can do is I can say, here, here's some topics that you might find of interest. Here's how they're used. Here's some of the things you can do with them and then let and push you to go do the rest. That's really your job at that point. If that is of interest to you and you find it that it, you think you can use it to help your company or the, whatever, uh, whatever educational experience you're trying to pursue, whether you're trying to become certified or whether you're interested in a particular area of maybe you want to go into hardware, maybe you want to go into software, maybe you want to go into operating, uh, operating systems or system support, and that's all good. So yeah, I mean, there's some uh, there's some really critical decisions that are coming up that you folks are going to have to deal with. And sorry, that's the legacy that has built up over time as machines have gained uh, performance. There's always these factors that are called enablers. As machines become more powerful, there are technology enablers that trigger, like artificial intelligence. That started way back in the 80s, but it couldn't be practical until the machines reached a, a, a certain size of memory and disk storage and speed to make artificial intelligence work. And that's a technology trigger. And so you'll find that happening over and over again as you progress. I've seen it. I've seen it too, in my career. So, uh, and those decisions that you'll need to make are the balance between knowledge and data collection. That's number one. Where do you draw the line between invasive uh, invasion of someone's privacy in order to collect data about that person? And then the other one is the balance between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Where do you draw the line there? I mean, even if you were to shift all of the knowledge workers over to artificial intelligence, there still has to be humans involved to build the systems and design the systems. Uh, yeah, artificial intelligence could eventually reach a point where it starts to develop and design its own, its own systems. And that's a day that a lot of people and science fiction writers have been fearful of for since the 1940s. <laughs> you can go back and read many science fiction books about that very topic. Also, the uh, balance between technology and human and humanity. What's the balance? I mean, the whole purpose of technology is to employ people, right? Uh, it is to save time in order to get information, but it is to employ people. That's what companies do. That's what we expect them to do. If they're all robots in there, well, great. I mean, uh, I hope the robots buy a lot of your company's products because the people that you employ certainly won't be. 
So there has to be a balance between technology and human and humanity, and I think you'll have to answer some of those questions in the coming years. Uh, and hopefully this challenge, uh, that particular challenge, uh, maybe I can help push you along a path to uh, try to answer some of those questions. Uh, I mean, I could answer them for you, but uh, I don't think that's my job anymore. I think that's your job now. So, yeah, so that's the reason why I started this channel was to help push different technologies and show you some of the things that I'm doing. I, like I said, I'm still learning. I'm still moving down the path. I do not know it all. Uh, and in areas, certain areas, it's probably pretty shallow of what I know. And there are other areas, it's probably very deep. So come along with me. I, and, I, and I hope to uh, see you more on the channel. Hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now. Mm -hmm.